Welcome to Midway Covenant Live. Worship will start in a couple minutes, but first, let's go over some stuff. Our mission at Midway Covenant is to boldly follow Christ in community, pursuing life-transforming relationships for God's honor and glory. This morning, we celebrate Easter Sunday. Pastor Sean Higgins teaches on the woman at the well from John 4. His sermon is called Reconcile Together. Did you know you can give online? You can now set up one-time or recurring offerings using your checking account. Debit or credit cards are okay. Navigate to go.midcov.org slash give to set it up or mail your check to the church office. Your leadership team is happy to announce that Pastor Deb Gustafson has answered the call to be our new interim pastor. She will begin May 1st. With those messages out of the way, let's join together worshiping the Lord. everyone so glad um, to get to worship with you through uh, these wonderful devices um, it is resurrection Sunday he is risen he is risen indeed amen and we get to uh, sing together we get to worship together we get to celebrate together for we know that death um, is defeated that Jesus conquered the grave and that we get to um, when we pass, we get to be with him in heaven for eternity. And so we sing and we celebrate this morning, knowing that and recognizing that he is um, He is with us. Amen. Um, so let's pray and we will um, worship through song. Amen. God, we thank you that you are with us, that you uh, conquered the grave, that we are no longer bound by sin, but that we are set free. God, that we are called your sons and daughters, Lord, that we um, are now blameless in your sight, God, for you have washed our sins away. Lord, we thank you for this time we could be together. We thank you for this time. Um, Lord, even though we are in separate spaces, we know that your spirit uh, is dwelling among us. And so, God, we, um, we sing out where we are in our places and our spaces, proclaiming that you are king of all, that you are savior, that you are um, the conqueror of the grave, that you um, are our redeemer, and um, you do great things. So, Lord, we love you, and we um, worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Yes, God, we raise a hallelujah to you, for you alone deserve the glory. You alone deserve the praise. And God, we know that um, you hold it all, that you hold today, you hold tomorrow, you hold our futures. And God, today we recognize and we celebrate together that Jesus, you have Rosen from the grave, that death has no sting, that the grave has no victory. And so, Lord, we rest in you, we trust in you, for you alone can give us peace. And you alone are our hope, you are the light of the world. And this morning, we want to continue to fix our eyes upon you. So may you open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive what you want to speak to us. And may we put those things into action. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, how good it is to be able to celebrate the reality of the resurrection on this Easter Sunday. Thank you for the certain knowledge of who you are. Thank you that in a world that is crazy around us, you never change. Thank you that in the midst of the frustrations that we face, you who conquered death remain able. And though we're scattered this morning, Lord, I thank you that we can be together worshiping you. Lord, we lift up one another this morning. We lift up those who are suffering physically, remembering that you are the great physician. You were the one who was able to touch bodies physically and bring healing. And Lord, we ask that you would do that. Lord, we pray that for those that need healing, perhaps in ways other than physical, and ask that you would likewise touch their lives, that you would supply what is needed, that you would give what is lacking. Lord, we lift up our community. We pray for the protection of people, we pray for wisdom. Lord, we pray for a soon return to normalcy. And yet I pray that with that would come a lasting dependence upon you, the God who conquered death. Lord, thank you for the reality of who you are. Thank you for the wonder that you would invite us to worship you. Thank you that you were the one who was able. Lord, as we lift one another to you, we do so with deep thanksgiving for all that you have given to us. Thank you for the power of the cross. Thank you for the power of the resurrection. And thank you for the reality of our hope. And thank you for your presence with us, your encouragement of us, your provision for us on this Easter Sunday. Lord, thank you for Midway Covenant Church. Thank you that its ministry continues. And Lord, as we have the opportunity, even though scattered, to continue giving to you, I pray that you would take our gifts, that you would multiply them, that you would be honored by them, and that you would give wisdom in their use to your glory and to the advance of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll see on the bottom of your screen, 
instructions for giving online. If you're not comfortable doing that, postal mail works as well. You can mail your check to the church or log on and give online. Thank you.
this time, let us pray a blessing on our children. Heavenly Father, thank you for our children here at Midway Community Covenant Church and all around the world. As a mom and an educator, I am reminded every day of how amazing and full of surprises each child is. Thank you, our Father and our Creator, for that. For their contagious laughter, their sense of wonder, their spontaneous hugs, and their readiness to embrace each new day. I'm thankful also for how tech savvy they are, and I'm very grateful for how capably they teach tech challenged adults like myself. Without doubt, our children bless us in so many ways. Today, on this Easter Resurrection Sunday, I pray that you, Heavenly Father, would bless the children. Help them to know that you love them and that you are worthy of their trust. Help them to cultivate a lifelong relationship with you as their Savior. May they find and stand on precious promises from your word. And may they talk to you in prayer knowing you are listening. Bless the children with the assurance that you are their Savior who knows, forgives, and loves them. And Father, as the adults in our children's lives, help us be the parents and caregivers that they need us to be. May we set aside our worries, leave our uncertainties and fears at your feet, and lead our children with the very hope, love, and forgiveness that you lead us with. We look to you, Father. Our children look to you. Be our refuge and fortress, and may your blessings and the promises in your word strengthen our children and their families. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from the fourth chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 4 through 26. And I'm reading from the NIV. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. 
the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. May God bless his word to us this morning. Well, good morning and welcome. I want to uh, thank you for joining us this morning as we commemorate um, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is probably the most important day in all of humanity, the day that we commemorate uh, Christ having died on the cross and risen for the resurrection and the resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins, defeating death and Satan on the cross. And I wanna be honest and say, I've been quite nervous about this and just simply, so much of an emphasis is put on this day and really bringing a good message and in all that I realize how inadequate I am and so um, I'm not going to worry about it I'm just going to simply put it in God's hands and let him speak to you but in any case this day is about reconciliation in the fact that Christ rose he, re he, he reconciled us to the Father. This is what we know, this is what is taught. But today I want to I want to speak on the broader implications of the resurrection. And that looking back to the fall, it was not only our relationship with God that was interrupted, but our relationship with one another. Uh, and, and I don't need to provide this grand illustration of what I'm talking about. You can simply um, look at the way things are today, the way they have always been. We simply just can't get along with one another. We hate ourselves. We, we, we find reasons to divide, reasons to separate, reasons to hate one another. Whatever it is, we just simply, uh, our relationship with one another is broken. And so the implications of the resurrection is that Christ not only rose to reconcile us to the Father, but he rose to reconcile us to one another that we could worship the Father as one in the body of Christ. And so today I want to focus on that. And I think that um, in light of what's going on, this is, uh, this is so timely and that uh, we're talking about being reconciled to one another. And so the, the, I'm going to be speaking on the, the scenario, or rather the, um, the, the interaction that Christ had with this Samaritan woman at the well. And I think that this speaks profoundly to the intentions of what Christ had in his ministry before he even went to the went to the cross he was looking to exemplify what his ministry was all about it was about bringing people back together and we see that that even the disciples they had no idea of this and we think of Peter when he didn't realize that the gospel was a message of inclusivity until Christ told him to go to the house of Cornelius and so we see here Christ beginning to demonstrate in this story that this message, this, this, this kingdom worship wasn't only meant for the Jews or for a particular race, but for everybody. And so looking here, I, I just want to give you some background on the, uh, the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. Well, uh, just to put it frankly, they hated one another. They, 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 the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They, in a typical route going from Judea to Galilee, they, this was typically a, a straight path. But what they would do is they would go far to the west. They would go all the way to the coast to go north to bypass uh, Samaria altogether. They would also go to the east, crossing the Jordan and going north and then going back west just to bypass Samaria altogether. They wanted nothing 
to do with the Samaritans. These were actually Jews that were um, during the Gentile, uh, these Gentile kingdoms came in and conquering the land. They would um, bring in other uh, nationalities into the land where the Samaritans lived. These were actually a, a tribe of Israel. Uh, and cohabitating with these other ethnicities, they began to intermarry and they created this sort of uh, melting pot of a culture. And so the Jews despised them. The Jews saw them as this mixed breed of, uh, of an abomination. And so they had nothing to do with them. And so automatically we see here in the beginning of this narrative that Christ is defying the social norms by going through Samaria. And so arriving at the well in Samaria, Jesus, it's, it is midday, it's in the heat of the day, Christ is sitting by the well and he's wanting a drink of water. And here comes this Samaritan woman. Now, to give you a bit, some bit of a background on the, the Samaritan woman, um, a lot of scholars, they'll demonize this woman and, and, and given what we know, uh, her having five husbands or being in five relationships, however you want to interpret that, um, most scholars will demonize her and say that this woman was a, a sort of a, a Lucy Flucy. She was uh, just a, a, an adulterous and fornicatious woman. And uh, typically because of what we know, and perhaps she was shunned by the other uh, women in the, in the region simply because she was coming to the well at a time of the day that was, uh, was untypical. It was unusual. The most, most of the women, they would come during the morning hours or the evening hours uh, during the cooler times. Well, there is another line of reasoning that would imply that, well, given the fact that men would often go to the well to, to seek out a wife, uh, we see this in the case of uh, Abraham's servant searching for uh, a wife for his son. He went to the well. This, the, the young women, they would come to the well. Uh, this was a woman's task. They would come and draw water from the well. So if one wanted to find a, or have their pick or to see what was available, they, this was the best place to go because this is where all the women were. And so when I began digging into this. I, 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 I could just, it, it was this, I, I could just really empathize with this, with this woman. And, and, and I really saw it in a different light and it spoke to me. And I don't see this woman uh, necessarily uh, being shunned, perhaps she was, but I, 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 I believe that there was a void in her life that she was so desperately searching to have that feel, didn't quite know where to find it. But coming to the well, not just in the midday, but perhaps throughout the day, in search of a husband, searching for someone that would love her and fill this void in her life that uh, she had yet to be able to fill. But consequently, this is only a void that God himself can fill. And so coming to the well, Jesus sees this woman coming and he asks her, woman, give me a drink. Give me a drink. He's, he's tired from the journey. He's just, just thirsty and wanting a drink. And this woman, she replies, she says, well, how is it that you being a Jew would ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For you have nothing to do with Samaritan. And so now, Understand how grave and how, how befuddled this woman must have been. Jews already despised Samaritans. And on top of that, according to rabbinical law, the Jewish, uh, well, the, the, sorry, the Samaritan women, they were considered to be uh, perpetually unclean. They were considered to be continuously on their cycle. Anything that they came into contact with, anything that they touched, was considered to be unclean. And this was really a way of calling them swine. We know that 
pork or a swine, a pig, it is unclean. And so this is what they are referring to the Samaritan women as swine. And so on top of them being an abomination, considered this half breed, this miscegenated breed of a people. And on top of that, this woman is considered swine. And here you have this this encounter where this Jewish man is not only speaking to her, but he's asking her for a drink. He's not just asking her for a drink, but he's saying, I'm wanting to drink from your bucket. He has no cup with him, and so he's going to drink from her pail. And so uh, it's only reasonable to assume the type of, imagine the type of uh, response she must have had. What is, are you serious? You know, if you continuously tell someone that they're lower than life, that they're the undercarriage of, of, of society, of humanity, that they're second and third and fourth class citizens, eventually they'll begin to believe that. As you reinforce that, they, they will believe that. And I see this woman feeling this, and, 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 but yet so desperate to find and feel this void that she's been feeling in her life. And so we see in this, already in this encounter, Christ is still, he's, he's just breaking all of these social norms. And, and it is, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's amazing that no one at the time really understood the implications of what he was saying. He was breaking down these barriers to bring the entire fold back into relation with God. Amen. And so we, we, we have him, her saying, well, how is it that you would ask me for a drink? And I know I, I can attest to this. I, I under, and I empathize, empathize, empathize with this woman simply because I know the feeling. I've said it myself. I'm sure that there's someone there listening who've asked this question, what do I have to offer God? Who am I that you would speak to me? Who am I that you would want anything from me? What do I have that God would want from me? But we see here Christ saying, I will drink from your cup. I will drink from your cup. And so we see here, at this point, really, it points to uh, Revelations 3.20, where Christ, he's telling John, the very author of this book, to write to these churches, saying, Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. If anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and dine with them, and then book me. I will eat of your plate, and then I will give you to eat of mine. He doesn't care what you've been through, what you've gone through, what who you are, what ethnicity you are, what, what social background you come from, what economical status you have. He is not looking at the flesh of the person, but he's looking at the heart of the individual. And he tells this woman, if you would have only known the gift of God, and knew who was asking you for a drink, you would have given me a drink, and I, in turn, would give you living water. He says that everyone that drinks of this well again, they'll be thirsty again. But everyone who drink, anyone who drinks of the well, of the water that I will give them, it will become in them a well, welling up to eternal life. This water that I am going to give you in return is going to quench your every thirst. It is going to fulfill all that you're searching for. The void in your life that only God can fill, that only can come from this living water that Christ is offering here to this woman. And so in, 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 in trying to really put myself into the, the this woman's shoes, uh, in a matter of speaking, um, 
I, I can't help but feel that this woman is, she's, as I said, she's searching for something. There's a void in her life. Uh, and she's just wanting to be loved, I believe. Uh, she's searched in all of these relationships, perhaps, to find, just to, uh, and I empathize because I've, I've, I've heard the stories of so many women, so many women I've had the privileges of hearing their stories and the struggles that they've gone through in life and just wanting to be loved. And, and in that search for love, being so abused and, and, and just, just treated horribly. And so I, I, I see this woman just searching, desperately searching to just to be loved the way that, uh, God created her to be loved. And how appropriate for her to come to this well and, and, and meet Christ, the ultimate husband. You, you, we read all of this, this imagery as Christ being the, the husband of the church and the church being the bride made of Christ. Paul, he exemplifies Christ as the, the arch typical husband. He tells us to, uh, to, 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 to men, husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. Serve your wives. And if necessary, lay your life down for her. How appropriate was her in search perhaps for this, 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 a husband to love her as she so desired to come across Christ. But yet Christ is here. He's speaking of spiritual matters. He's not talking about that of a physical uh, realm, but yet her mind has yet to grasp the implications of what Christ is saying. And so I can see Christ here kind of working and, and, and escalating the conversation so that she can understand what he's talking about. And after telling this woman that anyone who drinks of this water of mine, they will never thirst again. And I can see the, listening to what her response was, she says in verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. There is an emphasis emphasis on her saying, so I don't have to keep coming back. It implies that there is some significant anxiety in her coming back and searching continuously at this well. I, I can't help but feel that they're speaking sort of in parables. That what she's been searching for, she's been searching for at this well. And no matter how often she comes to it to find what she thinks is the answer, it, it, it's, it, it turns out to be the wrong answer. It's not fulfilling her, being that she's been through five husbands or in these five relationships that Christ has mentioned. And I, I can't help but feel the desperation in this verse in her saying, give this to me so I don't have to keep coming back here time and time again. I am weary. What comes to mind is when I think of the, those that are addicted to uh, uh, substance, drugs, or what have you, they, 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 they search for this, this answer to fill this void in their life. No matter how many times they put the needle to the arm, no matter how many times they, 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 they smoke of that pipe or they pop those pills, that each and, each and every time, it, it's not enough. They have to continue to keep searching for a, a, a bigger and a greater fix. There's nothing that will fill this void that is in their life. And so they, they, they're continuously searching. Unfortunately, it, it, it normally it brings them to their death. We see the desperation in people when they're searching for something. They're searching for that that answer to fill that void in their life, they search for it so desperately that they go to their deaths and trying to find it. And so, in looking at this, you can see that Christ is 
understanding this woman's, her, her desperation. But he knows that she doesn't quite understand what he is getting at. The implications of his, of this rendezvous. Perhaps she was searching and she thought that this was a potential husband for her. Being that he was a Jew and that he was willing to not only talk to her and engage in conversation with her, but would drink from her pail. Perhaps she was thinking that this was the husband that she had been searching for her entire life. Indeed he was, but not in the, 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 the manner that she was thinking. And so Jesus, he goes and he, he, he takes it to another level. He cuts down to the chase and he says, go and call your husband and come back. Now, like I said before, there are many different uh, interpretations of what may have been going on in this woman's mind and giving her response. But I, 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 I think that Perhaps she didn't want to ruin the prospect of this being the man that she'd been desiring. Yes, she says, I don't have a husband, but I don't think it was, I don't, me personally, I don't believe it was in the way that is typically interpreted as being shamed and, and saying, well, I don't have a husband, but rather I don't have a husband. Don't, don't, don't let that, that, that's not going to interfere with our conversation, with what we have coming on, with what I'm wanting you to give me. And Christ cutting to the point and says, you are right in saying that. You've had five husbands and the one that you have now is not your husband. The one that you think that you're hiding from me, I know about. But he isn't your husband either. I, I see him saying in this, understand, I'm not talking about that. We are talking of, I'm talking something of a more spiritual matter. And we see this, I, I see this because the conversation it immediately shifts to that of uh, a religious conversation. She says, sir, I, I, I see, I perceive that you're a prophet. And he, she goes on to say, but I feel the anxiety here in her words, she says that our forefathers, they, they told us that we are to worship on this mountain. But you Jews say that we're the, the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And I hear her saying, well, listen, I've worshipped here on this mountain. I've done that. I can't go to Jerusalem. You all think that we're an abomination. And above that, I am perpetually unclean. I am less than a human being to you all. So what do I have? What recourse do I have? I've tried it. I've tried this. I've tried that. I can't go there. What is it? What can I do? And Christ, he says, listen, woman, listen to what I'm saying. The time, the time is coming that the true worshipers of God, they will not worship on this mountain and they will not worship in Jerusalem. The time is coming, he says. The time is coming where the true worshipers of God will worship in spirit and in truth. The true worshipers of God will worship in spirit and in truth. He well aware of what calamity awaits him at the cross. He's speaking of this time. The time is coming where I'm going to lay my life down and raise it up again so that the, this geographical locations are irrelevant. Where you were born, your ethnicity, your economical status, your educational accolades, all of that will be rendered irrelevant. What is based on the flesh will be of no consequence. I'm going to lay my life down so that you can come and worship in spirit and in truth. 
the walls are going to be broken down. The chains will be broken. My people, God's people, will come together. And it won't be a matter of one's ethnicity. It won't be a matter of one's uh, denomination. It won't be a matter of, of one's social status. It will be a matter of the spirit. A time is coming, he says, where the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and in truth. That is so profound in that, especially at this time right now, with all of this going on, I, I find this so timely in that we are observing Christ's resurrection during what they're calling the, 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 the height of this pandemic. And amongst evangelical circles in the church there is no universal there is no resounding voice that is speaking out right now there's uh i've heard some say that no this thing right now this is of satan and and they've declared victory over it they've decried that this thing is defeated no don't worry about the economy we're declaring victory and it's going to bounce back even 10 times better than it ever was there are those that are saying, well, don't worry about what this is going on. All this is going on. God has always been doing what he's doing. He's just doing what he's always done. Just keep focusing and doing what you've been doing. It's going to be all right. There are those that are talking of the apocalypse. This is the end. Everyone has an answer. Everyone has a response. But what, in, in light of the implications of the resurrection, I've yet to hear in a resounding voice of the church to say that, you know, this is a time in looking at the resurrection of the cross and what he did, not only reconciling us to the Father, but reconciling us together so we could come to the Father as one. Maybe this is a time that we ought to be coming together and seeking God together. Maybe that this is a time that we ought to set aside denominations because you worship on this day or you see the Sabbath as this or because you hold this to be uh, the, the, the most important thing or, or because you do it this way. How about this is just all irrelevant and we come together as the body of Christ and seek his face together. If we are observing this day as the day that he's reconciled us together as the body of Christ, to the Father, why are we not doing that? It is written, when my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then will I forgive their sins, I will hear their voices and their prayers, and from heaven I will forgive them and heal the land. When God's people who are called by his name, come on Christians, if today is the day that you observe Christ raising from the dead and you put your faith in Christ that he died for the forgiveness of your sins to reconcile us to the Father, Today, you ought not be thinking of a denomination. You ought not be thinking of this or that, but whatever, whatever color you are, whatever ethnicity you are, how poor or how rich you are. This is a time for us to come together and seek his face as the body of Christ. There is but one body. Christ, he, he, he prays this to the Father. Father, keep them as one, just as you and I are one. So those that they, they will believe that you sent me. So the world right now will believe that he rose. There are those that will say, well, how do you know that Christ, he rose from the dead? You weren't there. How can you prove that? And they don't believe it. Because we are not together as one. 
He died and rose not only to, 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 to bring us back into relation with the Father, but to repair the relation with one another so we could worship Him together as the body. Doesn't matter what you've done in your life. Doesn't matter if you're a prostitute. Doesn't matter if you are a, a CEO. Doesn't matter if you're a drug dealer. Doesn't matter if you're a mass murderer. There is enough blood that was shed on that cross to forgive you of your sins. He's calling us to come together as the body of Christ to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. We're not there yet. Revelation 7, 9 tells us the same author of this book is, 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 is saying that he saw this great multitude, innumerable multitude with, from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, standing in white robes before the throne, before the Lamb, worshiping God. That is the eschatological discourse of the body of Christ. One day we will stand in unity, every nation, every tongue, every tribe. If we have not yet accomplished that, then we are doing something wrong. Christ is telling us, repent, turn from this way that has kept us from accomplishing that, and let us come together now as the body of Christ. This is why he died. He died so we could be a family in the spirit, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Together in the body of Christ as one, not as individuals. Not as one person celebrating their own reconciliation, their own relationship, but together. We are called to walk together in the body of Christ. Perhaps you, you're hearing this message and you have, you, you have no idea what this means. Perhaps you felt something when... I, I, I spoke about that, that desire, that, that void in your life not being fulfilled and searching far and wide for whatever to fulfill it, but yet to fall short, to not quench that desire that only God can fulfill. That is a, a desire that you have in you that only God can fill. I want to invite you to offer Christ the cup. To give him a drink of your pail. If you hear that voice knocking at the door, won't you open that door? Won't you invite him in to come in and dine with you and you with him? The water that he gives you to drink, it will become within you a well springing up to eternal life. Let us pray. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you that I thank you for what your son did on the cross. I thank you for the, the grander implications of what it meant. That everything that we lost when we fell, we gained again when he rose. Just thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you are. Father, I pray that your spirit be convicting right now convicting the leaders of the church that we would come together as one, as you resurrected to do, that we would come together and seek your face in humility and repentance, and you would hear our cries. Have mercy on us, O oh Father. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us, all that you've done, all that you're going to do. Lord, we love you. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you again for joining us this day. I pray that uh, this will be a day that we reflect on what Christ did for us when he rose, what he's gifted us with, and our obligation in honoring that gift, and coming together as one. Go in peace and serve the risen Lord. May God be with you, bless you, keep you safe, and, and just be mindful of him. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us for Midway Covenant Live. Be sure to join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for worship and learning.